at least a hope that the picture that we now have of the origin and evolution of the universe, the entire universe, is true. That means it will be the same picture a hundred years from now or a thousand years from now, forever. Just like our understanding of the basic laws of physics, of mechanics, of electromagnetism, of thermodynamics, of gravity, we are approaching, I think, that kind of understanding of the entire universe. Now, the, this is of course a very bold claim. So I want to summarize the two theses of this thought as follows. Cosmology is going through a scientific revolution that is creating humanity's first picture of the universe as a whole that might actually be true. And, at least equally surprising, in this new scientific picture, we are cosmically central and we live at a pivotal time. Now what could I possibly mean by that? The rest of this lecture is an attempt to explain. Let me start by giving you a bit of a tour of the cosmos as astronomers observe it. Of course, we're all familiar with the solar system. We live on the third rock from the sun. The third is the four inner rocky planets. It takes light eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth, about 40 minutes to Jupiter, about 80 minutes to Saturn, a few hours across the entire solar system. But it takes like 100,000 years to cross our Milky Way galaxy, which is enormously larger than our solar system. Our solar system is about halfway out from the center of the optical galaxy, about 25,000 light years out at the bottom of this little peak. Now, our own galaxy, the Milky Way, is just one of about 10,000 galaxies in what we call the local supercluster, or the Virgo supercluster. The best way to get a sense of how the galaxies are organized is to take a little trip across first our galaxy and then the Virgo supercluster. So, just a little orientation, our galaxy is part of what we call the local group. There is one other large galaxy in the local group, the Great Galaxy Andromeda, another fairly large and impressive spiral galaxy, uh, Messier number 33, or the Triangular Galaxy, and a lot of little galaxies. So let's have a look. We're going to take a voyage, starting in our own galaxy in our vicinity, and then ending up at the center of the Virgo Cluster. The Virgo Cluster is the densest concentration of galaxies for a hundred million light years around. Can I have the lights down? So, we're going to start by heading toward this constellation. Any amateur astronomers here should recognize this. This is the Milky Way. That's Betelgeuse, Rigel, the three belt stars of Orion. We're going to head toward the great nebula in Orion. We've put the data from the Hipparchus satellite on the distances and locations of about 100,000 bright stars into the computer and also lots of astronomical images so that we can move around. This is the Orion Nebula. It's a lot, a lot of gas out of which stars are forming and those young stars heat up the gas. This is the famous Horsehead Nebula, the dark cloud that hides the light behind it. Another nebula, the Rosette Nebula, a stellar nursery like the Orion Nebula, lit up by these hot stars. Here's another nebula, but this one is not a stellar birthplace, it's a stellar death place. This is where a star exploded. It was seen on Earth about a thousand years ago. We call it the Crab Nebula. You can see the Crab Pulsar a neutron star at the center, which is the remnant of that exploded star. Explosions like this create a huge amount of dust that blocks our view in the disk of the Milky Way. So let's rise up and out of the disk so that we can enjoy the gorgeous panorama of a gigantic galaxy like our own. 
As the Milky Way recedes into the distance with the large and small Magellanic Cloud and other satellite galaxies, everything we see now is a galaxy. We're heading for the Virgo Cluster. We're going to take a scenic route. There's the great galaxy in Andromeda, the triangular galaxy M33. As we cross this glowing gas cloud in M33, we're now two million light years from home. This is a nearby pair of galaxies, M81 and M2. Another beautiful spiral. Another spiral that was perturbed by interacting with a nearby galaxy, that's N51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. How do you can see that as we start to get near the Virgo Cluster, the Virgo Cluster is an intersection of filaments of galaxies. There's a filament or chain of galaxies. We're going to ride down this chain toward the Virgo Cluster. We're now in the midst of a lot of spiral galaxies, but as we approach the Virgo Cluster, we're seeing more elliptical galaxies, and this voyage ends at this gigantic elliptical galaxy at the central part of the Virgo Cluster, M30, M87. You can see a jet coming out of the center, powered by a gigantic black hole. The black hole at the center of this galaxy has a mass about three billion times the mass of our sun. Well, that was just a little trip. Let's look at the universe on a truly grand scale. There's been a mapping project going on for some time in the Northern Hemisphere, which is following on a large mapping project in the Southern Hemisphere. This was the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It operates with a telescope in New Mexico, and in certain directions, it's measured the distances to a lot of bright galaxies, and in those same directions, the distances to even brighter galaxies shown in red that are further away, and now shown in blue, the distances to galaxies that are much farther away, these are the quasars, very, very bright galaxies. And these objects are 28 billion, the most distant ones, are 28 billion light years away today. That may be puzzling, incidentally, because the universe itself is less than 14 billion years old. I'll come back to that. But let's just look at how these galaxies are distributed. So this is a visualization of about half a million galaxies and 75,000 quasars. It takes a little while. So we're backing away rapidly from the local region of the universe. Now about a billion light years away. The galaxies are piling up on top of each other in a region that's been particularly well mapped. We're now about two billion light years away as these red objects come in. These are the luminous red galaxies. You can start to see some structure. You can see great walls of galaxies. There's one with regions in between with very few galaxies. But in order to get a better sense of how these galaxies are distributed in three dimensions, it helps to rotate this image. What you see looks like slices through a sponge. Walls of galaxies surrounding empty regions and voids. Now the quasars. And now, you can only get with the help of a computer to illustrate this, never in reality. We're looking at the Big Bang from the outside. This multicolored view is the heat radiation of the Big Bang, shown in proper register with the galaxy. So let's cut this image in half and visualize it from our perspective at the center. So 
The first thing to appreciate is that as we look out in space, we're looking back in time. These more distant galaxies further away from us are galaxies whose light has been traveling for billions of years. And so we see these galaxies not as they are now, but as they were when the light left them. You'll notice that the most distant galaxies that are shown don't look anything like the spirals and ellipticals nearby. What we're going to do next is take another voyage, this time just in one direction, as far as we can see, with the best telescope that we've had, the Hubble Space Telescope and the Advanced Camera for Surveys, which unfortunately stopped working early last year. This is the deepest image that was taken with that camera on Hubble Space Telescope. Now we're going to start, again, looking toward Orion. There's Orion. There's Taurus the Bull. We're going to zoom into an area down here, which doesn't have a lot of bright stars or even galaxies in the foreground. We switch from ground-based images to Hubble Space Telescope images, deep Hubble Space Telescope images, and now the ultra-deep field. It's been possible to measure the redshifts and therefore effectively the distances to many of the galaxies in this field. And then to place them in the computer in three dimensions, as we did earlier with the, the nearby stars. And so when we do that, we can zoom into the image. The galaxies that are disappearing off to the side are the nearby galaxies, the galaxies that are left are further away, the galaxies that are still in the image. because the light has been red shifted because of the expansion of the universe. But when galaxies are forming a lot of young stars, their light is actually blue and even into the ultraviolet. So even after red shifting, it still looks pretty white. But we're now back to about 10 billion years ago, and you don't see any more of those elliptical or spiral galaxies. What you see are pretty irregular, oddly shaped things. And now we're looking at the Big Bang before galaxies have formed. If there were any bright galaxies here at Hubble Space Telescope, we would have seen them. So, to summarize, nearby, galaxies look a lot like the Milky Way or like elliptical galaxies. If we look out this far, we're looking back to about four and a half billion years ago when the Sun and the Earth formed. The next sphere shows when lots of big galaxies like the Milky Way started to form, something like 10 billion years ago. And then, just maybe half a billion years after the Big Bang, when these first bright but very oddly shaped galaxies formed. These are all images from the ultra deep field. Beyond that, our telescopes today don't show us galaxies. This is the cosmic dark ages. But as we get the ability to look further into the infrared, for example, with the James Webb Space Telescope, who will be launched in a few years, we expect to be able to see galaxies a little ways into this. But this is truly the cosmic dark ages. After the universe cooled down from the Big Bang, and before it was lit up by the light of young stars. The multicolored sphere is the sphere of the cosmic background radiation. That light has been traveling toward us since about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And beyond that is the edge of the part of the universe that we can observe in principle, but that we don't have any instruments that would let us observe now. With gravity waves, for example, we could observe all the way back to the cosmic horizon, the Big Bang itself. And we have hopes to be able to do that in a few decades, not sooner. 
Well, this is the view of the universe on the grand scale that modern cosmology gives us. What I want to do now is look at a different aspect of the universe. We've talked about the universe in space and time. Let's now talk about size. What we're doing here is representing the different sizes in the universe by wrapping 60 orders of magnitude in size around a circle in the shape of a snake swallowing its tail. It turns out that there is a smallest size in the universe represented by the tip of the tail. It's called the Planck length, about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. And of course, there's a larger size that we can see represented by the head about 10 to 29 centimeters, and that's the cosmic horizon. Where does that Planck length come from, the 10 to the minus 32 centimeters, the smallest size? This entire region, so what's being plotted here is mass, orders of magnitude, each tick mark is 10 orders of magnitude, mm -hmm. so a huge jump, 10 billion, and length, size. And a diagram like this, this entire region is ruled out by gravity. If something has a mass this big and is as small as the blue line, it collapses to no size at all. It's a black hole. This region is ruled out by the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics. The result is that there is a smallest size called the Planck length and correspondingly a mass of the Planck mass. There's not any limitation on mass, but you see, everything in the universe has to be in what we call the wedge of material reality, to the right of this wedge. So general relativity and quantum uncertainty produce the smallest size, the Planck length. Now on a diagram, in any complicated diagram, it's helpful to know where we are. So where are we? Well, we're about a meter high, and at least I'm about 100 kilograms. Unfortunately. And uh, so there we are in this diagram. Let's go back to the Ouroboros. Now you see where the plot like this, the smallest size, and then bigger and bigger sizes. Notice that we humans are right in the middle of all possible sizes. There's no accident. Intelligent creatures could only be about the size that we are. If they were much smaller, the size of ants or single cells, there wouldn't be enough complexity to have the most complicated system that we know in the entire universe, the human brain. If you are much larger, the size of a mountain or a planet, the speed of communication would limit the number of ideas that such a creature could have. The thinking would be done by smaller size individuals, and of course one could have a community of larger size, but the thinking creatures are going to be about our size. And that's basically because of the speed of light, the ultimate speed limit, and of course the speed of neural communication, which is us so much slower. I want to just say one more thing about sizes. And that is that different forces are important on different size scales. For the entire right-hand side, it's gravity that's the most important force. From the scale of, let's say, a mountain on Earth down to an atom, it's electromagnetism. Mountains are as high as they are because of a competition between the chemical forces, which are basically electromagnetic, that hold atoms together and apart, and the gravitational force pulling the mountain down, the force of the entire Earth pulling the mountain down. Of course, on a smaller planet like Mars, you can have higher mountains. The chemical forces are the same, the gravity is less. What about smaller scales? In the nucleus of an atom, it's the weak and strong interactions along with electromagnetism that control. Now, we have a great theory, okay, the particle physicists, it used to be a particle physicist anyway, uh, of the weak, strong, and electromagnetic interactions. It's called the standard model of particle physics. But in the standard model, there's no room for dark matter. I haven't mentioned dark matter until now. But dark matter is what the universe is mostly made of. It's not made of atoms. 
mostly, there's of course in Adams in this room and in stars. But the vast majority of the mass in the universe is something else. And the standard model doesn't have any room for that. So we imagine that the dark matter is probably connected with physics on scales we have not yet been able to probe, that we hope to be able to probe in the near future, with the Large Hadron Collider, for example, which is turning on later this year in Geneva, and the GLASS satellite, Gamma Ray's Large Area Space Telescope, which was just launched last week, sorry, two weeks ago, and which we're hoping is going to give us a brand new view of the high energy universe. Now what about the snake swallowing its tail stuff? The hope is that all the physics will get combined, except for gravity, into a grand unified theory. That's what the gut stands for. And even gravity will get combined with the rest of the laws of physics in a super unified theory, for example, super strength. This hope of unification is what's represented by the snake swallowing its tail. The symbol is something that was suggested by Sheldon Bachow, one of the inventors of grand unification of the, of the standard model. Unfortunately, superstring theory doesn't make any testable predictions, except possibly the existence of supersymmetric particles, one of which is a very nice candidate for the dark matter. But we don't know if that's really what the dark matter is. We're hoping to find out from the accelerator, from the glass satellite, from laboratory experiments, all of which are going on now at a very fast pace. The thing I want you to take away from this picture is that size matters, that different forces control on different size scales. All the forces are there on our scales, but the forces that are important are different on different size scales. This is something that was first appreciated, I think, by Galileo. This is a diagram from Galileo's last book, Discourses on Two New Sciences. Galileo pointed out that no animal could be three times its normal height and stay the same shape, simply scaled up. If the height increases by a factor of three and the same shape is maintained, then the bones have a cross-sectional area that's three times three or nine times bigger, and so the bones are about nine times stronger. But the animal weighs three times three times three times as much, so 27 times, and bones that are only nine times stronger can't hold up an animal that's 27 times more massive. That's why an elephant cannot look like a large gazelle. An elephant has to have much thicker bones proportional to its length. The bone is only three times longer, but it has to be much thicker. Do you think Hollywood understands that? <laughs> only mechanical models made with steel and things like that can avoid these or where these things are destroyed models and avoid these basic laws of physics. Well, let's switch to yet another perspective. I've mentioned dark matter. This is the ultra-deep field. It's a gorgeous view of the universe, but it's very misleading because all it shows is light. And most of the universe doesn't emit light. So now we're going to talk about the dark side of the universe. Let's first talk about what we see. This is a diagram that's familiar, I think, to everybody in the world, even though uh, the greenback is uh, losing some of its uh, pizzazz, and the shekel, of course, is going up. But anyway, uh, here we're using the symbol from the back of the American dollar bill to represent something different from what uh, the Great Seal of the United States represents. So, in the Great Seal of the United States, these 13 levels of bricks represent the 13 original colonies in the United States. And this is the eye of Providence, shining the founders of the United States hope fruitfully and compassionately on this new experiment, this new order of the ages. Well, this represents the new order of the ages from the astronomical perspective. The heavy base represents 98% of the visible atoms in the universe, which are just hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen and helium come out of the Big Bang, roughly at the ratio of one part helium to three parts hydrogen. And that's what the first stars were made of. Those stars make all the heavier elements, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, 
phosphorus, sulfur, iron, the stuff we are made of and that the earth is made of. You might think, living on earth, that what the earth and we are made of is the common stuff in the universe, but you'd be completely wrong. What we and the earth are made of, heavy elements forged in the stars, and spewed out as stardust by those explosions like the Crab Nebula. That represents a hundred of one percent of what the universe is made of. So let's look at the whole picture now. Hydrogen and helium, half a percent. All other visible atoms, a hundredth of a percent. Invisible atoms, invisible now, but visible to their effects at earlier times in the universe. We have five different ways of measuring the total atomic content of the universe, and they all give exactly the same answer, about four and a half percent. So we're quite confident that we've got that part right. About half a percent visible as far as we see, and about four percent probably in between the galaxies, surrounding the visible parts of galaxies and out in between the galaxies. But the bulk of the matter in the universe, the mass that holds our own galaxy together, is some invisible stuff called dark matter. And now we know that it moves very sluggishly in the early universe. And so I and other people started calling it cold dark matter about 20 some years ago. And that turned out to be the theory that works. Then about 10 years ago, the evidence became completely convincing that the vast majority of the density of the universe is to any of these forms of matter at all, it's something completely different that we call dark energy. It might be Einstein's cosmological constant, it might be something more complicated, but for sure what it does is it makes the universe expand faster and faster. That's the role of dark energy. However, this could be misleading because it doesn't make the whole universe expand faster and faster, it just makes the space between the galaxies expand faster and faster. The galaxies are held together by their dark matter. They will not expand unless the dark energy is of a particular pathological kind. It's the space between the galaxies, between the bound groups of galaxies, that will expand. So the basic picture that we're left with looks something like this. It's as if there's an ocean of dark energy. And on the ocean, there are these ghostly ships made of dark matter. And on the tallest mass of the biggest ships, there are little lights. Those are the galaxies. That's all we see. Now, why would anybody believe a crazy picture like that? Because the data forces us to. So, this is a marvelous instrument, which is still taking data. It's the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. It's located about a million kilometers on the side of the Earth, away from the Sun, because it must never point at any bright object like the Earth or the Moon or, heaven forbid, the Sun. It has a sensitivity to measure the temperature of empty space to a few millionths of a degree. And that's what produced that beautiful image that I showed you before of the heat radiation of the Big Bang. It was preceded by another wonderful instrument called the Cosmic Background Explorer, which first showed us the slight differences in temperature in different directions in space in 1992. But, so it gave us baby pictures of the universe, but they were so for a resolution that you couldn't tell what kind of a baby this universe was. Now we can tell. This is the difference in resolution between Kobe and Kobe now. And later this year, the European Space Agency is going to launch an even higher resolution instrument called Quant that will give us an even sharper view of the baby pictures of the universe. So these are the baby pictures from 1992, the Cosmic Background Explorer, and now much sharper. W map, and soon even sharper. And from the ground, we can get sharp images of little regions. Now, my colleagues and I and uh, other astrophysicists 
calculated the predictions of the theory that I've described to you with dark matter, cold dark matter, and dark energy. And the prediction is that if you plot the amount of power versus the angular scale, the prediction is the blue curve. And these calculations were done much more than a decade ago. When the first data came in from Kobe, we got it right. We predicted this amplitude, that's what it was. But we only basically got this, this flat part. When the WMAP data came in, and there had been hints of this data from balloons and other measurements before that, we got all of these white points. And ground-based data on smaller angular scales also basically agreed with the predictions of the theory. Now, you'll notice there are some discrepancies. But the latest data has removed the discrepancies. We now have much smaller error bars, and the ground-based data keeps getting better. And this is the kind of situation that makes scientists feel confident that we're on the right track. As the data gets better, the agreement with theory gets better. So this shows that the double dark theory, the theory of dark matter and dark energy as the dominant components of the universe, is correctly describing the Big Bang. Is that all? What about the rest of the universe? What about the distribution of galaxies? Well, the very same theory also fits all the observations we have from the smallest scales to the whole horizon. And I can show you graph after graph with detailed comparisons. There are no known discrepancies. So that's why we take this theory seriously. This cartoon shows a uh, drunk sitting on the stoop and telling his friend, quarks, neutrinos, mesons, all those damn particles you can't see. That's what drove me to drink. But now I can see them. <laughs> well, you too are going to see the dark matter because we can see, if we have a theory that we can trust, we can simulate what the dark matter distribution looks like on various scales. And we can look and see where the dark matter is with the help of a computer. So please turn off the lights and we'll see some more videos. Before I show you the next series of videos, let me explain that if we show the evolution of a piece of the universe as we think it really is, it would be very hard to see what was happening because it would have to start small and grow and grow bigger. But when it was small, we couldn't see what was going on. So for purposes of this illustration, we're going to blow them all up to the same size so that you can see what's going on. And the first thing you notice is that the universe starts out pretty smooth. That's half a billion years after the Big Bang. But in just a couple billion years, you see a lot more structure. That structure, we think, was put in at the very earliest stages of the universe as what some people call wrinkles in space. A little bit more on that in a minute. But the structure just gets clearer and sharper as time goes on. So let's watch as the universe evolves there's a clock counting down the billions of years since the Big Bang, and we're rotating the image so that you can see the three-dimensional structure. Now, nothing you see is a galaxy. It's just dark matter. The yellow regions are the dense regions where galaxies are forming, <coughs> deep inside these yellow blocks. You'll notice that the yellow forms these long filaments, and where the filaments cross, there are particularly big blobs. Well, the galaxies form along the filaments, and the galaxies in clusters are where the filaments cross. And we can predict where we would see galaxies, and we can compare that to the distribution of galaxies of the sort that you saw in that first video. And the distribution that's predicted agrees beautifully with the distribution that we see. Let's zoom in on a particular region where a galaxy the size of the Milky Way is forming. This incidentally is the supercomputer where we did these calculations. It's at the NASA's Ames Laboratory in Mountain View, California. So you see blobs of dark matter. In each of these little blobs, a galaxy is forming. As the blobs go through each other and then merge, these little 
forming galaxies and being constantly buffeted. And that's why we think those early galaxies don't look like the smooth spirals and ellipticals that we see today. But as time goes on, what typically happens is that only a fairly small object falls in to a big forming galaxy. And so that's why the galaxies can assume the nice smooth structure that we see. So, when the clock reads 13.7 billion years today, we have here two fairly big galaxies and lots and lots of little satellites. What's going to happen in the future? Well, it turns out that our galaxy and the other big nearby galaxy, the great galaxy Andromeda, are rushing toward each other. And in about 5 billion years, about the same time that the Earth gets incinerated as the sun turns into a red giant, these two galaxies are going to collide. What will happen then? Well, this is a visualization of what happens when big galaxies, like these two great spiral galaxies, collide. A merger between galaxies like the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy trigger gigantic starbursts in which millions, many millions of stars form. These are realistic images. We take into account the new stars, those are represented in blue, and also the dust. You can see dust in the middle. And this was a calculation that required tens of thousands of processor hours on NASA's Columbia supercomputer using Patrick Johnson's superb starburst code. Johnson is uh, one of our junior collaborators at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Each one of the thousand or so images you're going to see in the video that's coming up next involves running more than a million light rays per band, and we have three different colors, color bands. So here's the video. First, an ordinary spiral galaxy. Another spiral galaxy. Generalization that Einstein worked out in 1915 
of his special theory, which he developed in 1905. Now, how does this theory work? Well, of course, there's a mathematical description. What I'll give you next is a sort of pictorial representation. So the idea is what we call in our book the cosmic Las Vegas, because it's all governed by quantum uncertainty. So imagine that the little regions of the universe, some of which will ultimately develop into big banks, are represented by coins. And the coins are constantly flipping. If a coin comes up heads, then suddenly there are two coins and they're each twice as big. But if the coin comes up tails, it's half as big. Consider a coin that has a run of tails. So it gets smaller and smaller. Eventually, it becomes so small it can pass through this grating. It then exits eternity. Time begins with a big bang for that little patch of the universe. And it becomes a universe, it becomes a bubble. And it starts evolving. And you'll notice that I'm representing these bubbles by snowflakes, but each snowflake looks different. And that represents the possibility that each one has different laws of physics. So this is a multiverse on a truly grand scale, a multiverse of these different bubbles, none of which can communicate with each other because they're flying apart much faster than the speed of light. We don't yet know how to test this theory. It's like supersymmetry, or it's like super strength theory, rather. It's not clear what predictions this makes that are testable. But we have a hope, and, and there's reasons to, to have a hope, that it will be possible to test this theory and also super strength theory. We haven't got there yet. Well, it's time to conclude. Human beings are central to the universe, not in a simple geographical sense, Galileo certainly showed that that was wrong, but in at least seven different ways, all of us follow directly from astronomy and physics. We live at the center of our cosmic spheres of time, so does every other observer. The finite speed of light makes this inevitable. We are made of the rarest stuff in the entire universe, stardust, rarer than neutrino, rarer than Dark matter, for sure. We live in the middle of all possible sizes, where the possibility of tremendous variety and complexity coming in small packages keeps life interesting. Life of our complexity could bloom nowhere else on the cosmic ouroboros. So our size scale is home to you know. We live in a universe that may be a rare bubble of space-time, in the infinite seeding cauldron of the eternal super-universe of eternal inflation. Outside our unique and isolated bubble, which we call the Big Bang, there is neither space nor time as we know it. But here inside, there is time for evolution and history and a space across which connections can form and structures can develop. We live at the midpoint of cosmic time, which is also the peak moment in the entire evolution of the universe for astronomical observation. The most distant galaxies, which we have just acquired the ability to see with our technological developments like Hubble Space Telescope, are beginning to disappear over the cosmic horizon now that the expansion of the universe has begun to accelerate because of the effects of dark energy, which are becoming stronger and stronger as the universe thins out and the balance between dark matter and dark energy shifts to the dark energy. We live at the midpoint in the life of our planet. Earth and the solar system form about four and a half billion years ago. It has about six billion years to go before it is roasted when our sun turns into a red giant star. Complex life evolved on Earth about half a billion years ago, the so-called Cambrian explosion. And it has about half a billion years to go until the warming sun overheats the Earth. This is not the current concern about global warming. This is a much slower and longer-term process. Our sun, like all middle-aged stars of its type, is growing steadily hotter as 
the ash of the nuclear processes builds up in its core. The ash is helium. So more and more pressure is required to keep the nuclear furnace going, fusion at the center of the sun. And on the time scale of half a billion years, many millions of human generations, the Earth could become uninhabitable as the water all evaporates and then the oxygen and hydrogen are dissociated at the top of the atmosphere and the hydrogen is permanently lost and Earth turns into a doomed planet. A fate that could be postponed for many billion years if our descendants move Earth farther from the Sun, which is possible by astronomical engineering of a not so complicated type. It just requires changing the orbits of some large comets so that they can take energy from Jupiter and deliver the energy to Earth. Of course, this has to be done very carefully. Because <laughs> if such a comet hit it, it would be much worse than the thing that happened 65 million years ago and killed the dinosaurs. From the point of view of our species, today is late enough to have evolved to our present abilities, while early enough to have a multi-billion year potential future. To the generations alive now, it is late enough that we're sobering up to the scale of our problems, but not so late that we've lost all chance to solve them. This is a very special time that will never come again. And it's a human turning point in the following sense. We've had exponential, even super exponential growth in the human population for the last couple of centuries. Last century, the human population expanded by a factor of four. That never happened before, and it can never happen again. The Earth couldn't possibly support four times the current population. But our technological abilities have expanded much faster than that, so that we're now processing the surface of our planet exponentially increasing rates. And there are, of course, many different effects of that, only one of which is the growing carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere, which is going to double in the next 30 years compared to what it was in pre-industrial man, and then possibly double again, which will have gigantic uh, climate logical consequences. So we can change the future by making changes in our behavior now. The key thing is to realize that we are at a human turning point. And the key thing, from my perspective as a cosmologist, is to take a long view and to see our current situation in the perspective, not necessarily of cosmic time, although I think that helps, but certainly in the perspective of hundreds and thousands of years, and not in the short-term political perspective of the next election. So to summarize, think cosmically, act globally, eat locally. <laughs> Thanks very much. Let me just mention that uh, there's a lot of material from our book that's on our website, viewfromthecenter.com. And in particular, the videos that I showed all have links on the website, except for uh, that last one, which we haven't put up on the website yet, but we will. Uh, all the images are available to be downloaded, they're, they're free to be used. Uh, many more things are available at uh, viewfromthecenter.com. I'll be glad to take questions. We are open for discussion and questions from the floor. Anybody who has any questions or comments make a Oh, you're standing in front of the, uh, the website. <laughs> Yes. yes. I, I think somebody is reaching the microphone. You said that you thought that life on Earth is unique, and there is no other life in the in the in the universe because Carl Sagan he thought that there must be in other universes life, maybe in not the same uh, way that we are here on the Earth, but there must be life on the other planets or other other galaxies. I, I didn't say that, uh, I, actually I didn't express an opinion on that issue with one side or the other. I happen to agree with uh, Carl Sagan and our Santa Cruz colleague, Frank Drake. Drake is the one who uh, Sagan was following in this. Uh, he wrote 
an equation, which is popularly known as the Drake equation, that lets us estimate the probability of other technological civilizations that will emit signals that we can detect. And uh, the summary, the one sentence summary of the Drake equation is that the crucial undetermined parameter is how long these technological civilizations, so radio or light emitting civilizations, survive. And roughly speaking, the number of such entities in the Milky Way galaxy is approximately equal to the longevity of such civilizations in years. So we've been emitting radio waves for uh, 100 years, on a grand scale, maybe 50 years. If we wipe ourselves out in the near future, and that's typical, then there are, at any given time, about 50 such civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy. We have only searched out to a distance of about 100 light years for radio signals from other planetary systems, and we haven't found any. 100 light years is such a tiny part of our galaxy that if life is distributed in the way that we think in, in our galaxy, in what's called the galactic capital zone, then the chances would be very small to have heard any such signals up until now. A new Technology is going into operation, the so-called Allen Array, involving now tens, and soon we hope hundreds, of small dish antennas that will make it possible to scan a lot of skies simultaneously and go out to a distance of a thousand light years. The volume to a thousand light years compared to a hundred light years is ten times the distance, but the volume is a thousand times greater. And that's the first time that, according to the estimate I just gave, did you have any hope of getting another signal. So we might, and then the Allen Array just went into operation. So we might start to get signals sometime soon. And really, they're trying to raise money. It's a, the Allen Array is a joint project with the SETI Institute, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and the University of California. And I think one of the members of the SETI board, Professor Sanford Faber, is here in the audience. If people have more questions about SETI. Okay. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, please wait for the microphone. And there's somebody up there. Uh, you said that uh, the Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy are going to collide. But earlier you said that the universe is expanding, and I thought all the object matter is moving away from the center. So how is this colliding going to happen? Let me try to clarify. Very good question. Thank you. What I explained was that galaxies are held together by dark matter. And the galaxies, as far as we can tell, are not going to expand. They're going to stay the same size, and the distance between galaxies will grow larger. And that's why you thought I meant that the distance between our galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy would grow larger. But actually, we have good reason to think that our galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy are actually bound together by a lot of dark matter that surrounds and is within the region of the local group. So our galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy and the Triangulum galaxy, the other pretty spiral, and all those little satellite galaxies, over the next few billion years, they're all going to merge. And they're going to make an elliptical galaxy. And that's the fate of bound systems of galaxies. That's the ultimate fate. And in fact, something like three quarters of all the stars in the universe are already in these spheroidal structures. And only about a quarter are in spiral galaxies, in disk galaxies. So the universe has already evolved pretty far in this direction. But you also saw the Virgo cluster. We are not bound to the Virgo cluster. We are flying away from the Virgo cluster. And at the present rate of increasing expansion in about 100 billion years, even the Virgo cluster, the nearest reasonable sized cluster, will have disappeared outside our cosmic horizon. But that's a great extrapolation. It depends on our understanding of what the dark energy is. And when I gave you the 100, 100 billion year figure, that's assuming it's just Einstein's cosmological constant. A crucial question to understand how the universe evolved, and especially the future of the universe, is to figure out the nature of the dark energy. We think we can do it. We just need a few billion dollars. 
you know, we always just want a few more billion dollars. So there's up there. Dr. Primack, uh, that really was my question that you're, uh, uh, you know, discussing. How, in one case, the uh, dark matter holds the galaxies together, and yet, on the other hand, the dark matter is responsible for this expanding and accelerating universe. How could you reconcile th this issue? Well, what we say is that there's dark matter, which is some form of matter. We think it's probably some kind of elementary particle that just happens to have the property that it doesn't have electric charge. If it doesn't have electric charge, it doesn't interact with light. It doesn't emit light, it doesn't absorb light, it doesn't reflect light. It's dark in the sense that it doesn't interact with light. It's bend, it bends light gravitationally, but otherwise it doesn't interact with light. That's dark matter. But dark energy is a completely different kind of thing. It's not the same as dark matter at all. Dark energy has the property that it causes space to repel space. If it's the cosmological constant, it's just the property of space itself. The more space, the more cosmological constant, the more repulsion. And so you can see how this could lead to an exponential increase in the distances between objects in space. It's a runaway phenomenon. We think that that's what happened in the very early universe. That's what caused cosmic inflation. We're pretty sure cosmic inflation happened, and incidentally, that's what makes those structures in the very, very early universe in a way that we understand. But, in the very early universe, this dark energy that caused the universe to expand exponentially fast turned off. Possibly, the dark energy that's causing our present-day universe to expand faster will also turn off. Possibly, it's been, in fact, turning off over the past several billion years. How do we tell? We measure more carefully. For which we'll need a few billion dollars. Which can also produce a tremendous amount of additional astronomical data. That the American satellite that's the project to do this is called the Joint Dark Energy Mission. There are two European projects. One is called Space, the other one is called Dune. And I'm hoping that over the next decade, one or possibly a collaboration of these projects will lead to fruition. If anybody wishes to ask in Hebrew, I'm ready to translate, so don't have a barrier of language here if you want to ask questions. Uh, so I wanted to ask about um, when Andromeda and North Way collide, so what the, why do we think that it, was, it is going to be a spiral galaxy, the end of it, the end of the process? So why do spiral galaxies form? Yeah. It turns out there are different shaped spiral galaxies. And we think there are actually several different related processes that produce different shaped spiral galaxies. But the basic picture goes like this. And incidentally, we think it's also connected to how the solar system forms. So the basic idea is that if you have a gas cloud, that's rotating. Gravity will pull it together and the gas particles will hit each other and energy that was initially moving the gas particles around will get radiated away. Light will be emitted and heat radiation. And the result is that the system becomes a disk. It can't radiate away the thing we call angular momentum. So as it shrinks, it spins faster and faster, just like an ice skater pulling in her arms and spinning faster. The same phenomenon, conservation of angular momentum, as this is called it. And so the disk is formed because of conservation of angular momentum, but loss of energy. The difference is that in the solar system, there wasn't any dark matter, just ordinary matter, just that. But on the scale of a galaxy, the dark matter is actually in control. The result is that in the solar system, 
Practically all the mass is in the sun. Most of that gas collapsed to form the sun, and only a little bit made the planets. The result is that the farther the planets are from the sun, the slower they're moving. In the galaxy, because the dark matter is what's controlling, the stars are going about the same speed, independent of their distance from the center. So a star that's twice as far away has to go twice as far around, the circumference is proportional to the radius, so it takes twice as long. But it's going at the same speed. Whereas Jupiter, which is five times farther, which is five times farther away than the Earth, is going one over square root of five, a little more than, a little less than half as fast as the Earth is going on. So, aside from the difference of the dark matter controlling galaxies, and no dark matter on the scale, of negligible dark matter on the scale of the solar system, it's basically the same phenomenon. Immanuel Kant, the great philosopher, was the first one who figured out that that's how things should work, both on the scale of galaxies and also on the scale of planetary systems. And the details were worked out by Pierre Laplace, the great French mathematical physicist, around 1800. So they were speculating. Now we have good reasons to think that this is actually a pretty good approximation to the theory. Now the details of how this actually works, how the gas gets into the galaxies and so forth, is something that a lot of us are working on, and Professor Dekel is one of the world's great experts. <laughs> uh, now, in fact, quite a few astrophysicists in the audience here. Do you have any embarrassing questions to ask here? <laughs> <laughs> Those are the most fun kinds. Okay, so we do next. Yes. Um, you have mentioned before there are quasars that are supposed to be 28 billion light years away. So billion, whole, billion. Yeah. So the whole universe is only 40 billion light. Exactly. Like 40 billion years old. How is that so? Yes, and I also said I was going to come back to that, and I didn't. So thank you for the question. So obviously the only way they could get so far away is to be traveling faster than the speed of light. And incidentally, the cosmic background radiation was emitted by matter that's out there on that big sphere with the multicolor. That's 46 billion light years away. Now, we calculate these figures by simply working out the general relativistic theory of a universe that's expanding with dark matter and dark energy. And it's that very same theory that makes those predictions of that curve with all the wiggles, with every point following the wiggles, and all the other predictions, like the one about the distribution of the different kinds of structures on different size scales. So, since the theory seems to fit the data perfectly, we trust it. And so we work out how far away things are that we see today. The idea is that when the quasars emitted their light, they were much closer. But they emitted that light only a few billion years after the universe started. And then after that, they've been moving away faster and faster, and in recent billions of years, the last few billion years, they've been moving away faster than the speed of light. So that's the explanation. And incidentally, let me just add one more part to it. Remember, the Virgo cluster, I didn't mention the number, but it was on the diagram. The Virgo cluster is about 60 million light years away, 60 million light years away today. And we're flying away from it. The cosmic background radiation was emitted by matter that was only about 46 million light years away from the matter that would become us about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. But the universe was expanding very rapidly then. It slowed down, and then it started speeding up. That's what the theory says. And so when we calculate how far away it is now, it's a thousand times farther away. We can actually measure that. That's the redshift of the cosmic heat radiation. And that means that instead of being 46 million light years away, it's now 46 billion light years away. This is the kind of simple calculation that we give as homework assignments in beginning cosmology. And it's just an exercise in using general relativity 
plus the assumption of the amount of dark matter and the amount of dark energy. Let me just mention that, as far as we can tell, the universe could be infinite. It's only that we are limited to seeing a finite part of it, because we are limited by the time from the Big Bang till the present, for the light to travel from the edge where we can see the present to some horizon, but it could be infinite. The, the question as to whether it's infinite or not is the, is, translates to the question of whether eternal inflation started a finite length of time ago or an infinite length of time ago. And that's a controversial question. We don't know the answer. One last question. Is there an embarrassing question or not? Uh, I have a question, if I may. Um, you tell us that uh, with the Hubble telescope, we can look to uh, really far distances. But if we look at our own Milky Way, we are not able to see uh, any star that shows the Keplerian motion, where uh, the effects of dark matter are not apparent. Why is it that we cannot identify any uh, body that shows Keplerian motion in our Milky Way? Well, of course, the planets obey Kepler's law perfectly. It's just that on large scales in our galaxy, it's the dark matter that's controlling. And the dark matter has a density distribution that's roughly 1 over r squared in the region of, the unit of our galaxy that we can do these measurements. It turns out that that's exactly what simple theory of how dark matter should behave predicts. So this flat rotation curve that I mentioned earlier, the idea that the stars are going around at the same speed, independent of their distance, contrary to Kepler. Kepler would say, if the mass is where the stars are, namely mostly in the center of the galaxy, the more distant stars should be going slower and slower. I've personally examined the rotation curves of over a thousand galaxies. I have never seen one that looks Keplerian. So it's not something special about our galaxy. This is absolutely standard. Every galaxy that we have ever seen behaves the same way. Every galaxy is dominated by dark matter. It's That's a very good question, and the answer is nobody knows. Uh, so the question is, how far out does the dark matter extend? The distance is, so the question is, how far out do we have tracers? And the answer is that we have two different ways of measuring how far out the dark matter goes in a fairly direct way. One is to look for satellite galaxies and to measure the relative motion of the satellites compared to the central galaxy. Now that Sloan Digital Sky Survey measured the velocities of over half a million galaxies when that visualization was made. They've now measured about a million. So it's possible using the Sloan Sky Survey to ask the question, if there's a central galaxy and then you look for less bright companions. How fast are the companions going compared to the central galaxy as a function of the distance of the companion from the central galaxy? And the answer is, out to a distance of about, I'm translating uh, into light years, um, about a million light years. Out to about a million light years, we still see the satellites going around about the same speed. And we just haven't been able to, to get enough satellite. The problem is if you start to go further away, you get confused. Because is a, a galaxy that's farther than a million light years from another galaxy, is it a satellite of that galaxy or is it you know, doing something else? So it's hard to do that kind of measurement beyond about a million light years. The other way that we can do the measurement is using the bending of light by the gravity of the dark matter. That's called gravitational lensing. Einstein first pointed out that light would be bent by gravity in his classic 1915 paper on general relativity. It was confirmed in 1919 by the Eclipse Expedition. And this is what made Einstein into a worldwide celebrity. And then Einstein pointed out in the 30s that this is a method that could be used on large scale. And also, Fritz Wicke specifically mentioned, just after Einstein's paper, that you can use this to measure the galaxies. And so we've done that. This is 
project that's being done now? And the answer is, out to about the same distance, about a million light years around the galaxy, the dark matter halo extends. Now we have good reason to think it doesn't extend much further than that, because if it did, we would add up to more dark matter than there is. So I think the answer is about a million light years, roughly. But you understand that that last part is an inference, it's not a direct measurement. The direct measurements show that out to about a million light years, we're not seeing Keplerian motion, we're seeing the dark matter extend. Now, incidentally, though, so we are seeing evidence that the dark matter is falling off, the density of dark matter is falling off faster than that one over R squared. So we're seeing a deviation from the flat rotation curves at the greatest distances, which incidentally is exactly what cold dark matter predicts. <coughs> With these heavy notes, we conclude our Madhu series for this year. Thank you, Professor Kramer, again for the fascinating talk. My pleasure. And thanks the loyal participants of Madua and we we'll see you in the fall in the new Madhu's Madhu's. Bye bye.